Bibles for our scripture reading. We turn this evening to the book of Exodus. We'll begin in Exodus chapter 4, verse 29, and read through chapter 5, verse 9. If you're able, I ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. In our text, Moses, who has encountered God in the burning bush, has been sent to Egypt together with his brother Aaron, and they now come to God's people and to Pharaoh. Hear then the reading of God's word. Exodus 4, beginning at verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Please, let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it. Let them not regard false words. Grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. So far in the evenings, we have looked at men who have encountered God. We think of those encounters where God has revealed himself to be a God of promise, a God of grace, a God of covenant. We think of God's declaration to Abraham, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. We think of God condescending to meet with Jacob coming to him in the appearance of a man and allowing Jacob to wrestle with him to seek the blessing of God. We think of God revealing himself to Moses as he reveals himself to be a God who is mindful of his people, who reveals the greatness of his being, I am who I am. He might be rightly worshipped. But not everyone who would encounter God would come to God in humility, in faith, in obedience. And we see Pharaoh, who encounters God through God's servant, Moses. We see how he rejects the word of God, how he rejects God, and how God will respond For though Pharaoh would reject God and deny him, yet at the end we will see, turning a few chapters later, that finally he is forced to acknowledge who God is. Yet it does his soul no good. And so we think about this God. And he is a God who is jealous for his honor and glory. God deserves all praise and adoration. There is none like him. 
the creator and sustainer of all things. And therefore, God is a jealous God, rightfully demanding acknowledgement of his being and of his position in the world. We have this tendency to think that jealousy is something bad. We are jealous. It means somebody else has something or is something that we are not. We are jealous of them. God is not jealous of others. He is jealous for his own glory. And we see that again and again in Scripture, that God, to be true to himself and who he is, has a jealousy, a zeal for his own glory. Think of that in a couple of places where we read that in the Ten Commandments, where God distinguishes himself from all the imagined gods of the people. And in verse 5 of Exodus 20, declares, You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. God is a jealous God. He will not share his glory, his worship with any other being. We see that reminder again in Deuteronomy 4.24 where Moses is recounting for Israel history. And it reminds them, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. We see it in the prophets again. In Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 25, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. You see, all of God's attributes are his focus, and he is jealous for himself, for his reputation. And God has met Moses and declared who he is. And Moses now goes to the people, and he goes as the messenger of God. And here we note something, that God now meets people through his messenger. It is not God himself who appears to all of Israel. It is not God who appears to Pharaoh, but rather it is Moses and Aaron with him who are the spokesmen of God. And the word of God that comes from them is not somehow diluted and has no authority. It is the word of God, faithfully communicated. The words are given to Moses, and they are the words of God that are to be obeyed, to be revered, to be honored, because it is God who speaks through his prophet. Think later of the apostles who would speak the message of Christ. But they make their appeal on behalf of Christ and have his authority that they may establish that foundation of the church upon which it is built. The word of God comes to us yet as it is read as it is preached, as it is faithful to the word of God, it has the authority of God himself. The word of God then calls for belief and for obedience. To believe God is who he is. Even as he has revealed himself to Moses, I am who I am. It is to be received and accepted. God's place in the world because he is self-existent, independent of all creation, that he is the rightful ruler over the nation and over the hearts of every individual. Therefore, there is an obedience that is owed to God. An obedience. This is what Moses comes to the people with. The word of God. We sometimes think if only we could hear those words. 
If only we could have that encounter of Moses with God, or at least as the people with Moses. To see even the shining of the face of Moses. And yet, we need to remember that we hear the words of Christ. In Ephesians 4, we're reminded, and it says something that we so easily read over. But there the apostle writes, If indeed you have heard him, heard Jesus, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, and did you notice? It is not you have heard about him. You have not been taught about him. But you have heard him and been taught by him. That it is Jesus who, who commits himself to his word in the preaching of the gospel. That it is Jesus who makes his appeal. It is Jesus who sets forth his truth. And we are to recognize here the privilege, the blessing that we have as God's people, that Jesus addresses us. And therefore, the same expectation that was of Pharaoh, of the people, is true of us. To acknowledge God, to obey his holy word. What is that first commandment of God? To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To find in him the Savior, the forgiveness of our sin. And so Moses and Aaron come and they are setting forth the truth, the power, the claim of God himself. And we see the response first briefly, the people, because here's the contrast that is set up. The people hear the words of Moses as Aaron relays them. As the children of Israel are gathered, the elders of the children of Israel, we read the people believe. <laughs> they believe. They accepted the words. And what is the natural response? They worshipped. They worshipped God who had revealed himself that he had heard the cries of his people, that he had come to deliver them. Now, it would not be quite as quick and easy as the people of Israel would have hoped, and they readily become discouraged, but here they hear the words of God, they believe and they worship. The contrast is Pharaoh. the ruler, the mightiest nation on earth at that time. And Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may worship. And what is Pharaoh's response? Remember we talked, what was the expected response? The acknowledgement of who God is and obedience to him. And here we see a man in all of his pride and arrogance and all of his power and authority. And you see from his response that these very two things he absolutely denies. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is he? He denies his existence, his power, his place. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? He will not heed. He will not obey. He will not acknowledge God. And therefore he rejects the instruction, the command of God that comes through Moses and Aaron. He repeats it. It's as if he's making a point. In verse 2 again, then he says, I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. He has taken his stand. He has hardened his heart. He will not heed. 
you notice the appeal. The appeal of Aaron and of Moses. But they know God. And God has commanded the people to worship. And therefore they say, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. They have seen him. They have met him. Please let us go three days journey into the desert that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us, lest our disobedience to his word consequences for us. And in response, you see again the absolute position Pharaoh takes. He will not acknowledge God. So he goes beyond that, for he becomes a law to himself. He will not acknowledge anyone greater than himself. And in Egypt, he was considered, he was viewed as a god. And he would not submit himself to the Lord God Almighty. And he will be challenged by Moses. And there will be the demonstration of the power of God in increasing measure. Here, hardness of heart, a rejection of the word of God. Instead, he says, look at these people. They're idle. They want to have time to go and to go into the wilderness to sacrifice. And he says, no, I will determine what they will do. They will work harder. I will impose my judgment upon them, and they will give an account to me for their idleness. They worship their God. It's as if he says, Fooey, forget it. They will serve me. Therefore, they will not have straw given to them to make their bricks. They must go and gather it themselves and still make the same number of bricks. You see how this God, through his messenger, encounters Pharaoh. His utter rejection of the Lord God. He will not heed him. He will not acknowledge him. He does not know him, for he has closed his eyes to all the evidence that is all around him of a creator, the creation that speaks of his majesty, of his power, of his might, of his wisdom. Moses, under the direction of God, begins to show the folly of all the gods of Egypt all the plethora of gods that they worship, the plagues come and they destroy Egypt. And the gods of Egypt are powerless in the sight of God. And we know that increasingly the Egyptians are made aware who God is and of his great power and the cost of disobedience until the last plague come, the death of the firstborn. You think of the cost to Egypt because of their stubborn and rebellious disobedience, their refusal to acknowledge God as the Lord God Almighty. And it is then, finally, that Pharaoh is broken to some measure. We read in Exodus 12, verse 31, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. You see in there implicit the acknowledgement that God is one who has the power to rule. 
Pharaoh had sought to bargain at different times with Moses and Aaron, really with God. You can go, but your flocks and your herds have to stay. You can go, but your children have to stay. And every time, no, we will obey God on his terms. We will not compromise. Now, Pharaoh is broken. His firstborn is dead. That of all his advisors, of all his people. And he says, go, serve the Lord. Serve him. Take your children. Take your flocks, your herds. He seeks a blessing. He must acknowledge something of God. Yet the sad part is that his heart is not humbled before God. It is not broken. Yes, there is a worldly sorrow. He has lost much of the wealth of Egypt. He has lost his firstborn. It is only a worldly sorrow. How do we know that? After the time of mourning, what does he do? He gathers his army to go after Israel, to enslave them once again. He will not acknowledge that here is God's people, the apple of his eye. He would seek to enslave them again, and we know the end of it. It is his destruction. As the waters of the Red Sea cover his army. And we think that encounter. As Moses speaks the word of God, as he represents God himself to Pharaoh. We think of Pharaoh as he hardens his heart again and again and again until he is finally broken by the judge of all the earth. And what do we learn from this? We think of our God who is jealous. We're reminded even in the book of Hebrews, the end of chapter 12, our God is a consuming fire. we would have a right honor and respect fear of the Lord God Almighty that we would acknowledge that he is the Lord he is who he is that he is independent of me and of all things that he is the exalted ruler of heaven and earth We search our hearts. How do you respond? As God's word comes to you. As the word comes to you through Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Do we say as... A recent survey indicates 40% of Christians, at least those who call themselves Christians, deny that statement and say there are more ways to God than Jesus Christ? No, God is jealous. And if he has sent his son who declares, I am the way, there is no one beside me, we dare to defy him acknowledge it here is the grace of God a word that invites us to himself we may find our peace with him there is another side to it as well for we receive that word the word that is Jesus Christ we receive it and believe it. We acknowledge who he is and what he has done and his claim upon our lives that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Then we see as well that each is called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. We are called to speak those words. We are called to be the messenger of God. 
And what is that message that we have? That Jesus Christ is risen. That he is the hope that he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. When we think of the great responsibility and the great authority given to us, for those who reject that message from us are like Pharaoh, rejecting God as he rejects his messenger. God judges Pharaoh. And therefore, we pray to the Lord, Lord, give me clarity as I speak the words of Christ. As I speak of the reality of sin and the hope of escape from the judgment due to sin, I may present Christ in all of his beauty and his compassion and his care. The one who said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you a rest." We are his ambassadors. All to proclaim his name. All to proclaim that God is a jealous God. He will not say, you could come to me through Jesus, through Muhammad, or through Buddha, or whoever you like. No, God says, my son is the only way of salvation. We proclaim it without apologizing, for it is the truth of God. We are but ambassadors, can only speak God has spoken to us. But as we have heard Jesus Christ, as we have learned him, so we also speak. We pray for those that we interact with that they would not harden their hearts as Pharaoh did. For we know that they will face the true and living God. They will come to see judge of all the earth. We marvel and we glory in the grace of God that we may embrace Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the covenant, that we may say, here is my hope, here is my salvation, and it is certain, it is sure, because it is God himself who fulfills that covenant gives me peace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we are reminded in passages such as this of what is at stake. We hear the words of God. As we encounter God in his word proclaimed to us, Lord, we think of Pharaoh who hardened his heart, who rejected the truth, who had the demonstration of the power of God before him time and again, and yet rejected who God was and disobeyed him. O oh Lord, we pray that you would humble our hearts, that we may acknowledge you as God of gods, as Lord of lords, as King of kings, the one who has every right to rule in every way. Now we pray that we may know your peace, that we may know your covenant in Jesus Christ and find our hope and assurance in him. For Lord, how we marvel at the greatness of your grace and rejoice to be your servant. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In response, let us turn to...